nice. So we gotta wire you up. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. And um, I, Michelle has this little thing over there that it's like green. Yep. But, uh, Okay, we'll get started again. <clears throat> so our next session, we're going to have um, three short talks, and then, and then we'll have another uh, longer regional keynote uh, talk. So our first speaker is uh, Megan Brasher from the Department of Molecular and Cellular Biology. She's going to talk to you about uh, SNARE. Hi everyone, my name is Megan and I'm a PhD candidate in Dr. Coppolino's lab and today I'm going to be discussing some of my PhD research that is entitled The Analysis of Snare Regulation During Tumor Cell Invasion. So the extracellular matrix is a network of protein and carbohydrates that provides biochemical and structural support to the cell. Uh, remodeling of the ECM is required for cellular migration and cellular invasion and is an integral part of many physiological processes like the maintenance of tissue architecture and embryogenesis. However, the progression of pathological disorders is mediated by abnormal cellular invasion and an example of this is cancer. So we all know that the metastatic cascade is the process by which primary tumor cells migrate to distant tissues and establish secondary tumors. However, so first, primary tumor cells must be able to degrade their surrounding extracellular matrix, and one method that tumor cells use is making these F-actin protrusions known as invadipodia. So in, like I said, invadipodia are F-actin protrusions that reach into the extracellular matrix to help degrade it. So in order, in order for tumor cells to maintain their invasive phenotype, they must be constantly assembling and disassembling invadipodia at the leading edge of the cell, and they do this in four steps. So the first step is initiation, in which we get uh, focal adhesion-based signaling with the ECM by the recruitment of integrins and receptor tyrosine kinases. The second is assembly, in which we get actin polymerization occurring through the recruitment of proteins like cortactin and NWASP. The third step is maturation, and this is when we get the proteolytic ability achieved through the, the recruitment of matrix metalloproteases uh, like MM MT1, MMP. So these proteases are able to degrade the surrounding extracellular matrix. And the final step is disassembly, in which these proteins are removed and recycled. So in order for these key proteins to get to the cell surface, to get to the spot of invadipodia formation, they have to first be trafficked there. So this is partly done by snare-mediated trafficking. Uh, so snares are soluble and ethylamine-sensitive factor attachment protein receptors, and they function in a variety of trafficking pathways and membrane fusion events. So we can see here on our target membrane, we have two T-snares, and on our vesicle, we have a V-snare. So these two T-snares on the target membrane interact to form a transsnare complex. This then allows the thing can then get delivery of our carbo to the specific membrane. 
So it's been found in our lab that by inhibiting specific snares, we actually decrease in Vedapodia formation. So previously, we've looked at snares like Syntaxin 4, SNAP23, and VAMP7, and perturbing these all decrease in Vedapodia formation. However, the regulation of snares may play a crucial role to this process, but it's not well studied. So another snare that interacts with Syntaxin 4 and SNAP23 is VAMP2, which hasn't been well studied in our, uh, in our model. So we use MDA MB231 cells, which are an adeno breast, can breast cancer cell line. Uh, the reason we use them is they form in Vedapodia in vitro when they're plated on an ECM-like substance. So we want, I wanted to see if VAMP2 expression was also required for Invadopodia formation, since we know that Syntaxin 4 and SNAP23 are. So I did this by knocking down VAMP2 using shRNA, and we plated these cells onto fluorescent gelatin. So it's labeled red, and when the cells degrade the gelatin, they leave behind this like black puncta. We then can stain the cells for an invadopodial marker like F-actin, overlay the images, and quantify for invadopodia formation. So we can see here, our parental cells are able to form invadopodia, same with our empty vector control. However, when we knock down VAMP2 via shRNA, we get a decrease in invadopodia formation. So this is after a four hour time point. So we can also do this for a longer time point. We call it gelatin degradation. So basically they make bigger spots of degradation. We quantify that. We see the same kind of phenotype where we get a decreased uh, of these cells ability to degrade gelatin, indicating the expression of VAMP2 is required for invadopodia formation. We then wanted to somehow inhibit VAMP2 function, so we did this by expressing VAMP2 cyto, which is basically all of the protein, but it's lacking its plasma membrane domain. So because of this, it's basically cytosolic, it's like free-floating, it can bind to other snares, but it's not going to be found in that vesicle. So it's not going to allow for uh, that vesicle to come in and fuse. It's basically acting as a competitive inhibitor. So we did this uh, Vedapodia formation assay again at four hours. So we look at our parental cells, they're able to form in Vedapodia, same with our empty vector control. However, when we're expressing VAMP2 cyto, we get a decrease in Invadopodia formation. We also use the full-length protein as our control, and these cells are also able to make Invadopodia. So this is quantified here. We can also do this for, again, a longer time point to look at gelatin degradation. We see the same phenotype, that we get a decrease of these cells' ability to uh, degrade the gelatin, indicating that not only is the expression important, but the function of VAMP2 is important for Invadopodia formation. So it's been previously found in our lab, like I said before, that syntaxin 4 is required for invadopodia formation, and this was done by a previous uh, PhD student in our lab, Carla. She basically found that the snare complex required for this was syntaxin 4, SNAP23, and VAMP7, and this snare complex was found to deliver MT1MMP to the cell surface. And she looked at the inhibition of syntaxin 4 in the same manner I did, using syntaxin 4 cyto. She also knocked down syntaxin 4 via SHSIRNA and saw a decrease in invadopodia formation, indicating the snare plays an important role. However, the regulation of snares is not well characterized, like I said previously. So this brings us to another graduate student's work, Dave. Uh, he looked for a regulator of snares, and he found a candidate called MONK18C. So MONK18C is a SEC1 MONK18 protein, and they have established roles in GLUT4 trafficking. Uh, however, the roles for these proteins in a cell invasion context are not well characterized. So like I said, MONK18C is a known regulator of syntaxin 4, and it can bind to syntaxin 4 when it's in a snare complex, but the method I'm going to be focusing on today is MONK18C binding to the N-terminus of syntaxin 4. So it's been previously characterized that MONK18C binds residues 1 through 29 of syntaxin 4. So we're going to use that as a competitive inhibitor in our cells. So I expressed this, this peptide, or this amino acids 1 through 29 in our cell lines, added a GFP tag so we could see it. And um, we confirmed that it was indeed acting as a competitive inhibitor. So basically, this 1 through 29 can bind to monk 18 c which is going to decrease endogenous syntaxin 4 binding to monk. So first we wanted to see if perturbing this monk 18 c interaction with syntaxin 4 infect, affected snare complex formation. So I immunoprecipitated VAMP2 in the syntaxin 4 N-terminal peptide cells, and we get a decrease in the amount of VAMP2 co-IPing to syntaxin 4. We also did this with SNAP23. 
and we can see here that the same phenotype exists, we get a decrease in SNAP23 binding syntaxin 4, indicating that MONK18C interaction with syntaxin 4 is required for snare complex formation. We then wanted to see if this N-terminal peptide could decrease in beta podia formation. I don't show the data here, but we, by expressing this N-terminal peptide, we get a decrease in beta podia formation as well as cell invasion. So since we're seeing these phenotypes, we're wondering if that's affecting the trafficking of key and beta podio proteins to the cell surface. So we did a biotinylation assay, and we looked at three different proteins that are trafficked to beta podia. So EGFR, beta-1 integrin, and MT1-MMP. So you can see here, in cells that are expressing our syntaxin for N-terminal peptide, we're getting a decrease of EGFR and MT1-MMP to the cell surface, indicating that MONK18C function is required for this trafficking event. We then wanted to see, since we saw that MT1-MMP and EGFR are decreased at the cell surface, we were wondering if this was going to affect cell invasion. So we subjected these cells to a transwell matrigel boyden assay. You can see here that our syntaxin for N-terminal cells did indeed have a decreased ability to invade through that matrigel. So not only does um, not only does the function of MONK is required for trafficking of EGFR and MT1 to the cell surface, but it also is required for cellular invasion. So some next steps that we're currently working on. Uh, we were able to send some stable cell lines expressing syntaxin for full length, syntaxin for cyto, which I talked about previously, it lacks that plasma membrane domain, so acts as a competitive inhibitor, as well as syntaxin for N-terminal to BC cancer. Uh, they injected these mice into, injected these cell lines into immunocompromised mice uh, in the mammary, mammary fat pads, and then they looked at lung metastasis. So we can see here in this graph, in our control syntaxin for full length, we do get a fair bit of metastasis, basically weighing the lungs. However, when we, uh, in the mice that were injected with syntaxin for cyto or syntaxin for N-terminal, we get a decrease in lung weight, aka these cells can't metastasize as easily. We also looked, they also looked at a Kaplan-Meier survival curve, and our syntaxin for full lengths did not survive as long as our treatments. So my research is going towards looking at a smaller peptide than 1 through 29. I'm going to be looking at 1 through 15 and also 15 through 29. So a really important residue that's been characterized previously is leucine 8 in that 1 through 29, and it's been shown that it's required for binding to MONK18C. So by looking at the residues 1 through 15 and 15 through 29, we're wondering if a smaller peptide can bind to MONK18C. So we did a couple experiments. Uh, first, we looked at invadipodia formation like before. You can see here that when we express 1 through 15, we get a similar result as seen previously with the syntaxin for N-terminal, that we get decreased invadipodia formation. However, we don't see this in the 15 through 29. We also subjected these cells to a Boyden transwell matrigel assay as well. We see a similar phenotype as the syntaxin for N-terminal, and we get a decrease in cellular invasion. So to kind of summarize, invadipodia formation requires trafficking of key invadipodial proteins to the cell surface, and kind of a working model that we're thinking is occurring. We have our two T snares at the plasma membrane. We have syntaxin 4 and SNAP23. Uh, and then, so upon MONK18C binding to syntaxin 4, uh, we get trans-snare complex formation. This allows for VAMP2 to come in and bring in the vesicle, which allows for the uh, transport of our EGFR and MT1-MMP to invade podia. So I did show that inhibition, inhibition of VAMP2, SNAP23, and syntaxin 4 decreases invade podia formation, gelatin degradation, and cell invasion, and that the invade podia formation is mediated by the snare syntaxin 4, VAMP2, and SNAP23, but regulated by MONK18C. So I'd just like to say a couple thank yous. Um, thank you for ICCI for allowing me to present. This is my second time, and it's been awesome. Uh, my advisor, Dr. Mark Coppolino, my past and present lab members, if their names in bold, they contributed to this work, my committee members, and well as our collaborators at BC Cancer. Thank you.
Either could be possible, so there's a multitude of snares. So like I said, um, there, like there's VAMP7. I'm talking about VAMP2, but VAMP7 has also been showed to be required for invaded POTI information. So there could be a somewhat redundancy there, where just because it doesn't have you know, the formation of syntaxin 4 complexes, it could be other ones that eventually come in, or they could be using a different method of uh, metastasizing. Yeah, so something to look into. Thank you. Um, that I don't know. I have nothing I've really looked into. Um, when you look into literature, everything that seems to happen in GLUT4 trafficking doesn't really seem to apply here. So it's hard to make those connections. So yeah, something to look into. Thank you. Thanks. They go in different sides, or are they okay here? Mm -hmm. They can go the same side. They need to. It doesn't matter. Very much. Why do we need to? Oops. Nope. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for the organizing, uh, to the organizing committee for inviting me here to talk today about the work that my students, Mackenzie Wan and Anita Lu, both of who abandoned me today. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the characterization of extracellular vesicles from culture explants of canine osteosarcoma and normal bone. So why are we interested in studying this in um, canine osteosarcoma precisely? Well, this is a real clinical problem in veterinary medicine. It's the most common primary bone tumor in dogs to begin with. It affects mostly large breeds uh, and most commonly affects the long bones. Um, the standard treatment includes limb amputation as well as chemotherapy, and that could be uh, usually carboplatin, doxorubicin, either of them. And the overall survival rate, despite of this type of treatment, which is aggressive, is only about 50% of the patients survive in one year. And this is related mostly to the development of lung metastasis as well as bone metastasis. There are, importantly, extensive similarities between dog and human osteosarcoma. The genetics, the gene expression profile, the biology, and even the treatments are similar. Therefore, it is an important translational model where both um, species can benefit from findings that we get in this particular model. Importantly, in relation to that, is also the fact that there are no reliable pronostic or predictive biomarkers for canine or human osteosarcoma. And here is where um, extracellular vesicles we believe may be important. What are extracellular vesicles? Well, they are membrane bound vesicles that are released by cells into the microenvironment from where they can access biofluids, such as, for instance, blood, urine, milk, etc. So the rules of release, the size, the markers that these uh, vesicles express are going to vary depending on the type of vesicle. And the best known of these vesicles are exosomes. So exosomes are usually coming from the endocytic pathway, and they are produced by the exocytosis of the vesicles that are inside these multivesicular bodies. So exocytosis is going to be DNA, RNA, proteins, or lipids. And this cargo reflects the cell of origin these vesicles are coming from, but more importantly also reflect the status, the biological processes that are going on in those cells. And they can be, when they are released, uptaken by neighboring cells, depending on where they have machinery to uptake them, and these cells can respond to this. So they are important for cell-cell communication as well. 
Importantly, because they are reflecting of ongoing biological processes, they are considered in our days as potential biomarkers. This blood sample, they isolate the plasma or serum from this blood into a chip, and then this chip will uh, be collecting these vesicles, binding to a particular marker they express, and looking at different target proteins that have been demonstrated to have pronostic or predictive value, and we can then quantify and use it as a biomarker of cancer. So this is the type of work we are trying to do, because if we want to use vesicles as a biomarker of cancer, we need to find out what those biomarkers are. And the way we are trying to find these biomarkers is in this macro project that we have developed here at Wealth that we have running for about uh, two years called Dog Bone. What we are doing in Dog Bone, we are a team of about eight researchers at the time. We are basically joining of efforts and our expertise to be able to maximize the use of samples to accelerate the discoveries of pronostic and predictive biomarkers of canine osteosarcoma. And the particular component I'm going to talk about today is the culture of explant, in this case from primary tumors, to isolate extracellular vesicles, EVs, and doing the protein profiling by mass spectrometry to identify potential biomarkers. So the mythos are um, is relatively straightforward. So we um, collect the samples, we separate the, fr the media, from the media, we isolate vesicles, or what we believe contain vesicles, but then we characterize them to make sure that we have those vesicles we are looking for. And finally, we do mass spectrometry and analyze the results to see if we have any proteins that are potentially interesting. To go into more detail about the collection of the samples, so we have a kind of patient that goes into surgery, and then following amputation, we collect sample of normal bone and tumor sample, okay? And then we mechanically dissociate it. We culture this tissue in the presence of media with serum, and this serum have been previously depleted from EBs so that they don't interfere with or EBs, and in the presence of serum for 24 hours. Then we collect, we concentrate the medium, and we separate it by size exclusion chromatography. And with size inclusion chromatography, we are gonna get a number of fractions and so this fraction then we need to analyze to identify markers of vesicles. In our particular case, there are two markers that have worked very well in dog glycates in our hands, and those are flotillin 1 and CD63. So these are the markers that we use. So in this table that you have on the left hand side, we have the uh, A samples of osteosarcoma and A samples of normal bone. And as you can see, all of the A samples of osteosarcoma express flotilling, while only six out of these A samples express CD63. In the case of normal bone, only four samples express flotilling, and three out of these express CD63. And this is a representative Western blood showing this is a patient that we considered negative for normal bone for CD63, and you can see how the markers is seen in the different fractions that we collect. So what we do next is then we pull those fractions and then we are going to analyze them by particle tracking. And particle tracking will tell us the concentration of different size of particles in our sample to figure out if we have the particles or vesicles we are looking for. And we also do electron microscopy, transmission electron microscopy. So uh, this is the results of the particle tracking analysis. So you have normal bone and osteosarcoma, A samples of osteosarcoma. Each sample have a different color here that they are overlaid. And at the top, we have four samples of normal bone. As you can see, the diversity of the size of the particles in the osteosarcoma samples was a lot larger. And that is expected. I mean, it's a complex uh, cell and heterogeneous cell population as well. And so you can see that the average particle size was about 145 nanometers in this case of osteosarcoma, and in the case of normal bone, about 200 nanometers. So we take these samples and we look at them on electron microscopy, and we observe vesicles there. A lot of the vesicles were in the 50 to 100 nanometers 
range of diameter si the size. And you can see here in magnified that these vesicles were looking like a donut, which is a typical shape that you will see in these particles called exosomes. A lot of the particles were like this, but we also got particles that are a little bit larger that are more compatible with things that are not exosomes as well. So this is not an exosome pure preparation, but that's okay because we didn't want to isolate only exosomes. We are interested in all vesicles. We just want to see if these vesicles can give us any information. So we did the mass spectrometry analysis and um, using a NO54 appeared to be only in osteosarcoma, 47 only in normal bone. Now, a lot of these proteins, we, we couldn't identify their function or what they were. However, for the ones we were able to identify, then they, they fell into different categories. And here, with these arrows in blue, I am trying to show you the ones that have the, the ones that belong to the larger categories. For example, a lot of them participate in cellular processes, biological regulation, metabolic processes, and response to a stimulus. Interestingly, for front of point of view, when we look at the proteins that show significant variation between normal bone and osteosarcoma, we were able to see that about 44% of those were proteins that were previously found to be in exosomes, which is a good sign because we know that we have something like exosomes in our, ves in our vesicle preparation. So this is a very small list of some of the proteins we found. So for those proteins that were amenable for a statistical analysis, we were able to find that 73 proteins were significantly different in normal bone versus osteosarcoma. And what I am showing you in this table are some of the proteins, a very limited number of the proteins that were enriched in osteosarcoma vesicles. And I, many of these proteins I am naming like PY and PX because of confidentiality reasons at this point. However, you notice that this one that have asterisks are the real thing. So these are the proteins, RPS3 and RPS158, which are ribosomal proteins that have been previously found to be overexpressed in osteosarcoma in comparison to normal bone. And also, and that is in humans, in human osteosarcoma. And apart from that, have been observed to have certain prognostic um, capability. But if you look at this carefully, you will notice that a lot of these proteins are part of the translation, protein translation, protein synthesis initiation. And in fact, what we went to see what pathways were, but what is here in purple, is showing you, and this is the initiation of translation, of protein translation pathway, and that I'm showing you is the ones that are in purple are the ones that were uh, enriched in osteosarcoma EVs as compared to normal bone. So um, this is showing us that we have, for some reason, an increase of proteins that are especially involved in initiation of translation. This is an example of one of these proteins, and this was a ribosomal protein, and this is the volcano plot, and this, what you see in green here, were things that were significant in osteosarcomas compared to normal bone, and this is one that is here, it's a ribosomal protein, one of my secret ribosomal proteins, and here you can see the samples individually for this protein, and you can see that the normal bone, many of the samples have none, only one has, and when you look at their matching partners, well, all of them have, and the number eight, normal bone number eight, and this one have higher as compared with the um, partner sample. So the protein, the ribosomal protein, one of the ribosomal proteins that was previously shown to be um, involved in human osteosarcoma is this ribosomal protein S3. And this is a study, and we, I particularly took this study because in this study, they only had nine patients, but they have matching samples from normal bone and osteosarcoma from the same patient. And this is what I am showing here. So this is their uh, immunohistochemistry, showing that normal bone, the expression was very, very low, and in osteosarcoma, very high. When they, they quantified the expression, they observed that the patients that had long metastasis and diagnosis have higher expression 
as compared to the patients that did not. And then when and they did the analysis of survival over time, they observed that the patients that have higher expression, in fact, have worse survival than the ones that have low expression, although it was not significant. But this is a very reduced number of patients that you can see. So you wouldn't find significance in this small population. So in summary, uh, we have found that we can identify floating and CD63 EBs, and we can, we can obtain them from explants of osteosarcoma and normal bone. And these EBs include that they are not only exosomes. And this is suggested by particle, particle tracking analysis, electron microscopy, and the proteomics as well. Uh, we identify different protein cargo in the normal bone versus osteosarcoma. Interestingly, osteosarcoma appears to be enriched in proteins that are involved in translation. And some of these are ribosomal proteins that indeed were shown to be, to have a role or appear to be involved as well in human osteosarcoma. So our future work now, well, we need to validate all of this data with antibodies in tissue and so on and so forth. Um, we also need to include a larger number of samples because we only have four normal bone here and we need more. But we are also including EBs from metastatic nodule explants that we think are going to bring even more interesting results in terms of uh, how the tumor progress and what the EBs can tell us about metastasis. So I just want to remind you what is the significance of this war. Uh, well, apart from we started in thinking, okay, this is going to lead us to prognostic or predictive factors for canine osteosarcoma. But some of these proteins, and I already started looking at the ones we had, are potentially targetable. So we may even get more efficient treatments for canine osteosarcoma. And because canine and human osteosarcoma are so similar, especially canine and pediatric osteosarcoma in terms of biology, gene expression, and so on and so forth, we can probably translate the results to humans and, and vice versa, get some um, important things from humans that can be applied to dogs. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the people that made this work possible. Uh, this, this looks simple here, but this has taken us two years to get where we are here. And I want to thank, uh, in particular, clinical trial coordinator Vicky Sabine and the tumor bank coordinator Kaya, who is here today. Uh, because without their help, we couldn't have implemented this. The patients, of course, that have given us their um, tissue, thanks to the donors that signed the consent for us to get this. And the people that have collaborated with us for the proteomic analysis, in particular, Dr. Janus Rack and his postdoc, Don Sik Choi, in um, McGill University, and Lauren Taylor, which is the manager of the facility at McGill University. This work was funded by NSERC. All of the uh, optimization for the protocol for the culture of explants was funded by NSERC, and the actual proteomics and all of the analysis by Pectros. I want to give a big thanks to my uh, dog bone team, some of who are here today, because this is also thanks to them that this project has been possible, both conceptually and logistically. Thank you, and we'll receive your question. <laughs> Time for maybe one question. Yes. It's really cool work in this whole area of extracellular vesicles. It's really quite interesting, especially at the cytokine levels and circulating. Mm -hmm. And that's the question you alluded to it in your significance uh, area. But if this truly is going to be a biomarker, you want to be able to measure it in the peripheral blood compartment, right? And so have you started looking for these things in your, in your samples of your dogs? That way you don't have to sample them. Metastatic samples in a, in a living dog. Yeah, so the whole idea, I don't know if you look at the, at the slide that we have for the dog bone project, so let's look at it more uh, carefully. So this is the dog bone project here. So basically what we are is collecting blood samples and then collecting these tumor samples and kind of simultaneously, okay? So these were samples we take at, at pre-treatment, we also take during treatment. Okay, and we have plasma from all of those patients. Yes, we are starting to isolate them from the plasma. Yeah, the plasma is really difficult, but it can be done. Oh yes, we are. We can't just like collect regular plasma per se. 
we, we have isolated them from plasma and we are now uh, improving this method with the help of the people at McGill, who is actually doing this on human patients. So yes, we are doing that and what we are planning to do in, in the case of the information that we get from these um, explants is to see if we can bring this information to the plasma. And, and this is very interesting because I show you this, this uh, signatures that we are getting, right? And there is a group in China now that has done the same in plasma and in getting very similar signatures, and this is with human patients. So we are optimistic that we, we could potentially get there. And two, one of you. Oh, do you want me to cut this short because of time? Shortish. Is good. Shortish, so you don't mind if I. It's fine. Turn. Yeah. So both of these? Yeah. Well, double. Am I going to trip on this? You might. The next speaker is Tony Abrams from the. And he's going to speak about. He's both on? Cane and lymphoma. It's metric for metric. This one? This one? Um, I don't think so. This one. So I think it's on. Yeah, it's Is it? Okay. This one, no, All right. That's fine. The button, I don't know. Somebody just pressed the mute button. Can this slide a bit? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's okay. I'll talk loudly. Well, it should be, it doesn't say mute anymore. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, let's start right into it. This is Louis. Uh, Louis is a six-year-old uh, male neutered English bulldog who had, was being undergoing treatment for lymphoma with the CHOP protocol. Um, and once the prednisone was off, the owners wanted to put him back on his NSAID because of osteoarthritis. So went back and looked at his biochemistry, that pretreatment biochemistry to make sure that renal function was okay. And his creatinine was fine, um, that was okay, but his SDMA um, was very elevated. So SDMA, which is symmetrical, symmetric dimethyl arginine, is a biomarker of kidney function. Like creatinine, it's cleared exclusively by the kidneys, but unlike creatinine that comes strictly from muscle, SDMA comes from all cells. And for that reason, when animals have muscle wasting, is a better biomarker of kidney function than creatinine. So it was elevated, which is odd, because most dogs, they're, they're proportional. And then the next day, in comes honey. Um, sorry. So this dog, when he's in uh, complete remission, uh, now the dog is in complete remission, so went back and remeasured SDMA on the dog, and now it was down to eight, from over 20 down to eight, which was a significant drop. There's some biological variation in this marker, but not a lot. Um, then came in Honey the next day. Um, she's a 10-year-old pug. She had naive lymphoma. Her creatinine was 122, so just in the upper end of reference range, and her SDMA was also elevated. Uh, she then, on the second week of the CHOP protocol, was judged to be in complete remission. Her creatinine had dropped, indicating that on the first day, some of that elevation in creatinine was pre-renal, but SDMA had dropped as well. All right, so the question is then, we're seeing a dis apparently disproportionate elevation in creatinine, uh, in SDMA compared to creatinine. To really truly say that, though, we have to have ratios. And ratios haven't really been as well much discussed as absolute values. But if we go back in the literature, for dogs with uh, acute kidney injury, uh, they had a median value of SDMA of 6.5, but all the way up to 20.9, which makes sense in acute kidney injury, injury that you would have um, some elevation in the ratios. So these are ratios. And with dogs with chronic kidney disease, where SDMA is first marketed, uh, the overall ratio is 10 with, with some elevation. So in the case of Louie, the SDMA ratio dropped from 29, about 21 down to 6.7, so normal. And for Honey, it dropped from around 16 down to 12. 
Uh, and just to give an idea, if we were to take an average normal SDMA in a dog, it'd be around nine, and creatinine in around mid-reference range to slightly low end of reference range would be 78, and a typical ratio would be 10. Uh, so um, on rest of workup, Louis had some small nodules in both kidneys that could have been infiltration, and sure enough, when the dog was in remission, those had resolved, so there probably was some renal infiltration. Uh, Honey had not had ultrasound as part of staging, but the kidneys were normal once in complete remission. All right, so based on that, we went back and looked at other cases, both here and at um, uh, the cooperating um, uh, referral practice, Veterinary 404. And of all those cases together, 25 active cases and seven um, uh, inactive ones, looked and at uh, pre-treatment SDMA, and it was elevated in well over 50%, close to 70% uh, in both hospitals. Uh, so based on that, then, we started to recruit new cases with naive lymphoma, ensuring that they all, that every time they came in, SDMA would be measured so we could track them throughout the progress of disease. And as well, because abdominal ultrasound is semi-elective, it's encouraged, but um, doesn't occur in every case, uh, it was put in there and funded so that we could have it all the time, uh, pre-treatment and, and during remission. Uh, and so based on that, and of course, there was informed uh, uh, owner consent. So this is the result. Uh, we can see that um, this is based on paired and unpaired linear regression. If we look at dogs with naive lymphoma, 73% of them had elevated SDMA, which was significantly lower uh, um, when they were in complete remission. And these are looking at the ratios, which do the same thing. So um, in those dogs, 35 of 40 dogs had had an abdominal ultrasound, and only one of them had evidence of infiltrative disease, suggesting that most of them did not. Now, ultrasound is a good diagnostic tool, but there's no doubt that it can't pick up very low level infiltration. So it's, it's, it'll pick up um, only to a certain level. So it's still possible that there is infiltrative disease in these. So um, based on naive dogs, so looking at these naive dogs, all of them had aggressive multicentral nodic lymphoma. They all had typical signaments. 40% were immunophenotyped, and without showing you all the statistics, essentially there was no correlation with any typical parameter used to characterize lymphoma in dogs and SDMA level. All right, now that is, um, so if we kept following Louis, uh, Louis unfortunately then relapsed, and this is his SDMA, so when he was naive, he was 22 in remission eight, in complete remission, um, judged to be right at the end of um, the protocol. It's beginning to go up, which didn't make us raise a weary eyebrow about this. And then relapse was 19, and then when he had progressive disease, 23. So it very, uh, it followed his bulky disease very closely. So if we then go and look at all other dogs, uh, comparing uh, remission, a uh, naive lymphoma versus relapse, see that there's essentially no difference. So bulky disease, uh, whether before treatment or after treatment, um, had the same results. All right, and then uh, if we looked at the dogs that were trending throughout treatment, when they were in progressive, sorry, partial remission, um, they were intermediate values as to be expected. Also, there were several dogs with extranodal lymphoma, uh, two dogs with renal, two dogs with GI, and one dog with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and essentially the results were exactly the same as with uh, nodal lymphoma. So the conclusion is over 50%, that's a conservative statement, it's probably more like 70%, of dogs with aggressive lymphoma have a disproportionate increased SDMA compared to creatinine, all right? When those dogs achieve complete remission, the SDMA normalizes, and when they relapse, it goes back up. So why is this? Now, first of all, I have this as preliminary, because sorry, this data is not mature. There's like a thousand more samples sitting in a freezer and lots more clinical data, but all it's going to do is increase the power. Um, so what are the features here um, of lymphoma? So it's an acute, compared to other neoplasms, it's an acute tumor. Um, muscle, because it's acute, muscle mass is normal, so that's not going to be affecting creatinine versus, um, uh, versus SDMA, unlike a dog with a chronic tumor, where if there's a lot of muscle wasting, then there'll be a disproportionate reason for that. But because SDMA doesn't have that, uh, we'd expect them to be proportionate. Um, there's a very high metabolic rate, and since SDMA is produced by metabolism, maybe that um, is relevant. It also is a tumor that can have spontaneous tumor lysis. Uh, it varies a wide age range of dogs, so a lot will not have chronic kidney disease. And I would think it's safe to say that most dogs being treated with lymphoma, there's not a usual concern about concurrent kidney disease. 
All right, so if we look at these features and look at possible mechanisms for elevated SDMA, um, so it's easy to think that SDMA could go up because of metabolic rate. If we look at human lymphoma, though, ADMA, which is asymmetric dimethyl arginine, uh, but not SDMA, is elevated. Uh, and then Yara Milley, um, this uh, investigator here, is the uh, scientist at IDEX that developed SDMA as a test in dogs. Uh, based on some preliminary results, him says it's the same thing in dogs. Uh, ADMA will go up, but not SDMA. All right. So based on that, the implication that, at least in most tumors, that SDMA actually reflects a decrease in, in kidney function. Like rate would be lactate in lymphoma would be lactate dehydrogenase. So on remaining serum samples, that was added on for uh, like 161 samples. Uh, that did not correlate with SDMA. We also have to keep in mind in trying to analyze this data that LDH is also cleared by the kidney. So it's, it's hard to find something else that's not affected by renal function. All right, what about tumor lysis? So metabolic rate, probably not. What about tumor lysis? Uh, we know that tumor lysis syndrome causes acute kidney injury. Is it possible that this is low-grade tumor lysis causing low-grade kidney injury, enough to be reflected in SDMA, but not in clinical kidney disease. Uh, based on that, potassium was normal in all dogs. If we look at normal markers of tumor lysis, a low number of dogs did have hyperphosphatemia and a low number had hypocalcemia, but not nearly enough to uh, account for the number of dogs with elevated SDMA. Uh, just like LDH was added on as another marker of tumor lysis, went on to bank samples and added on uric acid. Uh, there was, um, and if we look at naive dogs, all of them had um, the average, although they overlapped, the average um, uh, uric acid level was higher than uh, dogs in complete remission. Um, and then relapse went up. So this pattern of uric acid starting high, dropping, going back up, did more or less parallel SDMA, so tumor lysis may be a possibility. The other problem, though, is uric acid is also cleared by the kidneys, so it's, it's hard to get renal clearance out of there. And it wasn't particularly well coordinated with creatinine, but as we would expect, it was moderately correlated with SDMA. And so that brings up the question, maybe SDMA is simply a more sensitive marker for tumor lysis than, uh, or for uric acid nephropathy than any of the other traditional markers. All right, and the third mechanism, which is the one pr proposed by Yaramilli, is the AGXT2 enzyme is responsible for clearing ADMA, SDMA. Um, and it's, uh, and it, Yaramilli has reported that the, the enzyme sitting on the basement membrane of the kidney um, is got altered polarity, and that altered polarity altered polarity is due to beta amino isobutyrate. Now, beta amino isobutyrate is a product of pyrimidine catabolism, and it's also cleared by this enzyme, the same one that clears that. And so there's a possibility that although this is a normal enzyme substrate interaction, that somehow, since there's alt appears to be altered basement membrane polarity, is the fact that creatinine has a neutral charge and SDMA is a strong cation. So possibly uh, breakdown products of pyrimidines are altering the enzyme such that SDMA is elevated. Um, now, the other, feet, the other thing this enzyme does, it is responsible for the metabolism of glyoxalate down to glycine. And if that is impaired somehow, it could be actually pushing it to the other metabolic pathway and produce oxalates. And oxalate nephropathy is a well-known uh, problem in small animal medicine because of ethylene glycol poisoning. And it's possible then that maybe BAB is somehow pushing this into oxalates, and oxalates are causing low, uh, decreased kidney function. However, we also have to keep in mind that AGXT2 has polymorphisms in human medicine, and it's possible that just simply polymorphisms in dogs, and the dogs with one set of enzyme, with one enzyme uh, form, can raise SDMA and the other can't. So maybe it's strictly that. All right, so, and the last mechanism is that this is actually tumor infiltration into the kidney that's occurring below the level of ultrasound detection. Unfortunately, there's no, for clinical patients, there's no other practical way to go after it. There are some enhanced ultrasound techniques that could be done. Scheduling is still always a problem with patients coming in and out and trying to get the ultrasounds done on them. Biopsy is certainly not going to happen. Um, and there could be more attention at necropsy to dogs in relapse to look for um, uh, kidney infiltration. 
All right, so um, regardless of this, um, so I think I skipped over a slide here, yeah. Okay, so regardless of the mechanism, though, the key thing is if this is an acute kidney injury, it's a reversible injury. So what does this all mean? Is there any clinical relevance? Uh, it's very interesting, but so from an internist perspective, the occasional case is actually presented for an elevated SDMA for us to investigate kidney function, whereupon we just find lymphoma. Um, that has happened in a couple of cases. As a biomarker of kidney function, it's important for a clinician not to diagnose typical acute kidney injury or chronic kidney disease and use that as a reason not to treat the dog for lymphoma. For example, say, well, you know, I'm sorry your dog's got lymphoma, we could treat it, but hey, the kidneys are sick, so we won't bother. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, but beyond that, and clinicians, please feel free to disagree with me, overall, kidney diseases aren't that big a deal in dogs with lymphoma. So from the oncologist's perspective, this is some, to some extent a biomarker, maybe a biomarker of tumor, and maybe a biomarker of response, uh, because it is correlating, at least in some dogs, tumor burden. But we have to be careful not to flip this on its head, because we're judging SDMA validity based on a clinical judgment of remission, which still remains the standard. So is it not necessarily valid to flip that around and say, oh, then SDMA, we're going to use that to judge remission? Um, People are always looking for ways to evaluate minimal residual disease. Could this be one more mechanism? Possibly, but given some of the sophisticated molecular tools that are out there, this is probably way too crude. Um, maybe, as people are always coming up with predictive models, putting so many parameters into it, maybe this would have more utility in conjunction with other uh, biomarkers. Um, there's always an attempt to characterize a subset of lymphoma, hopefully with an with a implication that treatment could change. Um, maybe this would help characterize uh, lymphoma subtypes, in which case then it maybe it'd have a role in precision medicine. Um, at this point, though, it really remains an observation, uh, brings up some interesting possible mechanisms, and of course we never know exactly how that'll play out. Okay, um, I'd like to acknowledge um, basically everyone at the Animal Cancer Center. Uh, including the dogs, of course, uh, Dr. Binsley in pathobiology, uh, Dr. Zerlinden uh, reviewing ultrasounds and diagnostic imaging, um, clinicians at uh, VCA 404, and Pet Trust funding as well as some private donations. Thanks, Tony. Sorry? Has anyone missed the um, Yara Millie has, but he's not reported it. It's just been in a statement in the poster and in the oral presentation that ADMA is elevated, but beyond that. And because I was being so careful not to talk to IDEX about this, not to try to, you know, but just because I wanted to be declared no conflict of interest, really not discussed it more beyond that. But I've not seen any new data on ADMA. But the, the test to measure it does exist.